It is my privilege and joy that we can start a new Bible school, a new Bible study at the beginning of this year, and it is the message of Hebrews. And we want to study this in the context of these last days. Sometimes I ponder and I'm thinking, how can this be that I am living at the end of time? I'm amazed to see that that's what I have learned as a child. The songs that I sang in my childhood about the coming of Jesus now become reality. It is such a, a great offer that God gives us to live in these last days, to prepare him the way to come, to enlighten the world so that he can come into this world, to be the ones that are last, but be first to see him, because we will see him alive, without seeing death. What a privilege. What a responsibility that we can be his welcomer when he comes back the second time. So let us go into this study with this in mind to finish the work and see him coming. In these last days, until the second coming of Jesus, every human being on this earth who has reason must decide and must come to a final decision. Because it's the last days. There is no one that can escape this decision. Because the pressure that is done from the evil on him will not give him a chance to not stand either to one or to the other side. And we have to choose between the truth and the lie, between freedom and captivity. We have to choose between being dependent on God, worshiping God, or being dependent on Satan or worshiping Satan. Those are the two things. Those are the two elements. But now what makes the decision difficult, even though it shouldn't be difficult when you know God, but the difficulty lies in this, that the devil sells the lie as a truth. And he sells the captivity as freedom. And now we have two agents that offer the same thing. Truth is a need that we cannot live without, and freedom is a need that we cannot live without, and both, they're opposites, but both offer the same thing. Now how will one make the separation which is the freedom that is captivity and which is the truth that is a lie? So here the battle is. But we must know that there where certain elements are in that cannot be neither the truth nor freedom. In order to know that, we need to know that which will help us never to fall into the trap of the deceiver, that we might take his captivity as freedom or his lies as truth. And for this, we must have a foundation. And that foundation is the fundamental law of all things. This is the only law that guarantees us freedom and liberty. There is no other law that can give us liberty and freedom. Because it tells us the truth about ourselves. It is a knowledge of our being. It's clear to us. Because you see, a brother wrote me a, a message and said, in my church they have said to us that if we do not get this serum into our body, we are, not, we are breaking the law of God and we do not love our neighbor. And this is not the only church. We have church leaders that are very famous in our, in our um, church leading from the, great con from the um, general conference and to my leaders here in Germany just Recently, they, both leaders of the union did a video message showing that we should be very solidary to the others because the Bible says this, and this is the truth. The Bible says if you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin. And that is absolute. It's sin. 
That's why if we don't know the law, if we don't have the knowledge of our being, which is absolute, if we don't know the basic functions of our being and the basic needs for our lives, we might be deceived through this great man of faith, so we call them. I mean, at least they are leaders of the church who wants to suggest to us that we do sin when we do not get the serum in our body on an unnatural way, in an unnatural way. So how can you argue? Because some people go and say, well, we have to argue because the liberty of conscience, liberty of choice. Now, yes. But if your freedom, if your liberty brings to another person death or uh, damage, it cannot be called freedom. It is not. So that's why we must know by the law what is freedom, what is liberty. Because if you believe that your sputum is, being, is able to kill a person, if you think that you have something in you, physically mean, that you can, you have to put it out because you have no choice. You see, there is, it's full of spitting here on my, on my tablet because I cannot avoid when I speak that some of my body fluid comes out. Is this poison? Can my body ever be a poison to someone else? If that is possible, then you must do everything to avoid it. Because you have a law that says, love thy neighbor. Give even your life for him. But now if, if you refuse to do something on your body that might help your neighbor to be healthy, and you don't do it, it is sin. That's why we must know for sure when we defend our freedom, we defend it on a law. And the judge, if I ever will stand, and I'm pretty sure that I will stand in front of judges in the future, I will ask them this one question. Because the judge must prove. He cannot go on faith ideas. He must prove that my sputum, that my body, my spitting can be poison, can kill someone. If you can prove that, then everything I will do, I will go away and I will just shut up my way. I will never meet another person because I cannot avoid spitting. I cannot avoid to, to to transpire, I mean, I have things come out of me. I cannot avoid, when I kiss with a holy kiss, my brethren and sisters, to just give them some of my body content. I don't know what is on my body. And if that ever can be poison, then, friends, we must do whatever is told to us to do. But if not, if never my sputum can be poisoned, if my handshake can never be poisoned, if I can never, without my conscious choice, be a danger for my brother and my sister, then no one can force me to wear a mask, to make tests, or to give me a shot. Because that, then, would hinder no one's freedom because I cannot avoid that I exist. I cannot avoid my own breath. And since I cannot avoid that, it can never be poison. It can never be a danger for others. That's why if we don't know the truth about ourselves, about the law, 
of all beings. We cannot stand these days. If you believe in contagiousness, finally you must do what you have to do to avoid, to show love to your brother and sister and to your children and to your father and mother. And by not showing love, you will prove that you are false. Friends, so if we know the truth, it's easy to see the deception of the devil. But if we mix truth with error, you know, the contagious, the idea, you love the idea of freedom of choice and liberty of conscience, but at the same time, you believe in contagiousness. Now, if you believe in contagiousness, that takes away your liberty of conscience. Because then you can do something without your choice. Without you can even avoid it at ever and any time to kill your brother or to make him sick. And that is something that cannot exist. So these four things that I have enumerated here are absolute things. They are unchangeable. They are the scale for any information. If you don't have that as a scale for information, we won't go through this crisis. The devil will fool us because he knows how to fool us with good ideas. So I put together a few ideas, a few elements of how we take new information. So the spirit checks new information against prior knowledge and beliefs. So we live from information. But in order to have clarity and work with that information correctly, we need a foundation. Now, when the child is born, it doesn't have the foundation of science. That's why God told the Israelites, they should learn their children. Before you can check information, you must have a learned knowledge that is absolute. And God told his people that they should go to the law of nature. They should know that law. They should read it in the morning and in the daytime and in the evening and write it on the doorposts. Because that's absolute. The nature of man and the basic needs of man. So those are the foundation. That is science. Because it cannot be changed. And this must be the basis on which we check all information and also need to check our beliefs because we have also accumulated from our childhood beliefs. And there are certain beliefs that we have that are not checked by the knowledge, by science. So there are beliefs that we have. The one believes in immortality, believes in reincarnation, in certain teachings, Belief worship is just a, a religious matter, believes in judgment, the other doesn't believe in judgment, and they, are, they believe in infection or contagiousness. Those are beliefs. They must be put on a basis that you know those beliefs are correct. But if you put those beliefs into your mind without checking them or you miss the the basics, you miss these stones, the foundation, then you are a prey for the devil. No way to escape. No way to escape. That's why from our childhood, we should not teach children the beliefs first, but science, that which is unchangeable, the law, the nature of man, that they should understand themselves, their basic needs. And by that, they should accumulate their beliefs and check them on this so that their beliefs are as truth as the basis that they have. And then while we are continually growing because we need continually new information, we can check the new information on prior correct beliefs and on prior knowledge that we have learned, which is science. So that's why when we hear new information, if you have here certain beliefs that contradict the new information, you cannot take that new information. You will say it's, it's a lie. 
And we have this in these days very, very clearly. We cannot see what happens in the world and then we have a pre-knowledge of our teaching, especially on the word worship and on the word, on the word contagion, contagiousness. And then having those fixed ideas, which we didn't check with the law, it will make us to judge the information that God brings to us to make us free falsely, to reject them. That's why we must be able, when we hear the word, to learn those things first. Now we won't have time or we won't go in this study so to learn again the foundation because even Paul in chapter 6 says, I'm, I'm somehow he says in Hebrew, I, I'm tired to go back to milk again and again. I'm tired to go back to, to those things that should be there and we should go up to the higher level to go to the perfection. To speak about things that we check with this. Having a fast mind to uh, make a difference between evil and good. Yeah, he, he liked to make that check fast. So we have to study it for ourselves. To have a prior knowledge. To have a knowledge that is science, that can no one change, by which we can check every belief that we already accumulated. We must go through and see if it's correct. And then the new information that comes to us must be checked. And then if it complies with this, if it fits in, we take it as truth and we're safe. But if not, we let it out and remain safe as well. So in the book of Hebrews, we will have to interpret that book. And as we have to interpret the book, it must go through our spirit. And that's why we must have the same basis to interpret. And if we have the same basis, we might find different thing in the book because it is plenty of information there. But whatever we find, you and I will complement each other. It will never be a contradiction because if we check with the law, with the nature of man, the things, we cannot fail, never able to fail. So God will help us to do that. Before we now go into the book to see the cause why it was written, I want to lose a few words about worship because this is the theme for our time because dependency is worship. And I'm so amazed about my brother and sisters that have such a... a how can I say, a short-sighted definition of worship. Let's see what I mean. What is worship if we were a computer? If we were a computer, worship would mean the connection to the source of need. That is, for how many processes does a computer need power? Now, this question you put to any human on this earth, it will be the same answer for all. Because without power, without electricity, he can do nothing. So worship would be the connection with the power source. That's worship. So out of worship, out of the power source, the computer does all things. And nothing he can do without power. Now let's see what is worship for man. Man needs a connection to the source. That's worship. Either to God or to Satan or humans. For how many activities does he need a source of power? Now, as we have said it for the computer, it's also true for him, for all. Because the law does not permit that anything that God created, neither spirit nor physical, to be without a power source in order to do something. So for all activities, you need a connection to the source. For every thought, for every action, he depends on a source. There is no exception. Never you can think a thought or make an action without being dependent either on Satan, on humans, or on God. There is no exclusion. So, 
The connection to the source is worship. And that connection determines all your thoughts and actions. There is not one exemption. Now, if that is truth, why does the religious person reduce worship to a religious issue? I just heard, and we are speaking a lot about the three angels' message, and you have there the issue of worship. Worship God versus worship the beast and its image and so on. And it's amazing that I never heard until now. Maybe it changes. I pray to God it might change. A preacher to not bind worship to a religious matter. And my church is especially active to reduce worship to a religious issue that is to the day of worship. That's for the Jews as well. They reduced worship to religious things and especially to a day of worship. If we are not changing that, if we do not come to the understanding that worship is that what connects us to the source, and without connection to the source, we can do nothing, not one thought, not one move. If we don't understand that, it will show us our disaster and destruction. My brothers and my sisters, who reduce worship to a religious matter, will get lost because they never had understood the law and the human being. That the human being can do nothing without being connected to the source that he takes from. So let us keep that in mind through all this study. There is nothing that is not out of worship. Now let us go to the reason for the letter to the Hebrews. Whenever we study a book, whenever I study a book, my first question is, what is the reason for why this book was written? And to, in order to do that, you have to go through the book and I do it the same. I'm reading at the beginning and I'm reading at the end to see what's the issue. Now, of course, I read several times the book of Hebrews and I heard it because I want to have an overview over the thing and I want to know the reason why. And you find the reason through the whole book like a ref ref refrain, like a choir in between the phrases of a song so that what what repeats itself but i go to the book to the end of the book and there it says in hebrews 13 22 almost the last sentence and i beseech you brethren suffer the word of exhortation for i have written a letter unto you in a few words so this is a word of exhortation i took it to understanding it's a word of admonition, of warning. But about what is he warning? What is the danger that he's speaking about? Because you have word of exhortation and you beseech the brethren and they should take it. Because if not, there will be bad results. So let's go and see through the whole book where we find this repeating choir of the song hebrews 2 1 to 3 therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip so heed to the things which we have heard for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation. So you see the word of warning? Heed the things which we have heard because if angels have spoken, and we find here that uh, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, it says, God who had sundry, sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past 
and to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So he speaks to the angels, he speaks to the prophets, and he speaks to his son. So it must be an important message that he has to give us. And here he says, heed to the things which I have, you have heard, because they will happen. And if the one that have been disobedience had received the just recommend, recompense and reward, how shall you escape if you neglect? so great a salvation. I believe that's a very strong warning. Let's see if the choir repeats itself later. Hebrews 3, 7 to 8, 12 and 13. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, it looks like Paul lived today and God has spoken through his prophets exactly for the time of the end. So here we have worship. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. So what is today? Today is the time of grace. Today when we hear his voice, we should not harden the hearts. Because the today will end in our time. And when this today will end, everything is gone. Now as Today, God calls his people to awake and see what happens in the world. They should not harden their hearts in unbelief, departing from the living God. Now, you see, the departing from the living God for most Christians is not something that they realize that they do. But it's very simple. Ask yourself, do you believe in the living God who keeps you alive and who gives you health or sickness? Or do you believe in a dead God that is now all over the world in different forms and different uh, variances that kill the people? So if you, be you believe in a false God, you depart in unbelief from the living God. Who is God? That's the question in these last days. Is it a dead thing that kills? Or is it the living God? You see, I thought when this crisis began, it's almost now two years ago, I thought that my brother and sister will wake up when they see that all these measures, which are all irrational and nonsense, they are a degradation of the human reason. You know them. And the people don't even realize them. But I thought when they hear this, when they get this, and they see that someone is making a joke, an evil joke on them, and they do it to themselves. They obey this this ordinances which are purely stupidity and I thought that they will check it after the second the third because they change it every few days so that the mind gets confused you don't know where are we now I thought they will wake up the last Sabbath I spoke to the deacon because he is the one that uh, checks the people at the entrance and I said, do you know what you do? I said, do you know that what you do is sin? You cannot discriminate one person to not enter the church. Well, he said, I, I, I let them all enter. Yes. But you see, in other church, you cannot enter except you are having the shot or you have uh, the other QR code, but that you are healthy. 
because only safe people can go to church today. When they brought all the diseased to Jesus, when they brought all the diseased to the apostles, that was a great danger for the whole church. They kept them out. Did they so? The diseased are not allowed anymore to the church. Or, oh yes, they are allowed because if they make a test and they are negative, it doesn't matter if they are very sick, they're still okay to come. Friends, are we reasoning still? So, he told me, I said to him, you will stop people coming into the church if they don't have their, their approval, their safety. I said, no, we don't do this in our church. We won't, we won't do this in our church. I said, that I, I would be very happy if we won't do that in our church. There must come a time where we must wake up and harden not your heart as it is today. Because the time will come and the letter of the Hebrew shows us the time will come and it will be too late. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest that any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Hebrew 4, 1 to 2 and 11. So you see, we have a history of the people of God that here to preach the gospel as we have heard it, but not being mixed with faith in them, they heard it for nothing. So let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Is there a need of rest in this world? Yes. But that resting place is in our heart. And if we are in the living God, we are at rest. You see, I started to have joy in this crisis. I have joy because as the crisis gets narrower and faster. It's a psychic crisis, friends. That's why it's not a, a war of, of uh, a, a real war in, in, in physical matter. No, because the end time of this where we have to decide is a mental war. That's why it, the pressure is a mental pressure. And as this mental pressure is there because it's all about who you trust, all about who you worship. As this gets narrower, you get more free if you are in God. Isn't that nice? I'm, I'm starting to rejoice. I was almost two years. I, I fight it against the crisis. I, and I, sometimes I don't like it, especially when I see my brothers and sisters and how they, they go straight into the wrong direction. But I'm starting to see that the narrower the way becomes, the more stronger becomes our God and the more stronger our faith. Because we have, as he said here in his next words, a living God whom we believe. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. And we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's it. So we will not give up our hope and faith until the end because we do not believe in dead gods. We do not believe in the fictions or the science fictions that is shown to us we believe in the living god and in his promise and we will see marvelous things because i believe this year will be a decisive year uh, 
I don't know exactly what comes, but I expect the mark of the beast and the latter rain. And so, so we are at the end. At the end. And so, if we go with God, we are happy the narrower the way gets. Because then we know the stronger our God will show up and show us the way. Because in darkness, under persecution, we see if our mind is free. Then we can pass every test and we will inherit the promises. Hebrews 10, 28-31 He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Venegans belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, it's, it's not a fearful thing to be in the hands of uh, a non-living thing, but it's a fearful thing to be in the hand of the living God if you despise if you trodden under food, the Son of God. So it's a very great warning in which we are here. And it comes even a little bit better. Cast not away therefore your confidence with has great recompense or free reward. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Which promise? To see Jesus coming. That's our promise. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Wow. That's written for us. He will come. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So here we are. We want to receive the promise because we know he comes now. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So we will see him because we Follow to holiness. We want to get to perfection because we want to receive the latter rain and proclaim his last message under the greatest psych psychical stress and the greatest pressure of everything from outside. We will be holy and free because we are in the truth and we will see the Lord coming in the clouds of heaven, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So there's a danger. You see the admonition and the warning again and again. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. His first birthright, yes. For ye know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he thought it carefully with tears. Now, this is amazing how Paul puts in the end of time the picture of Esau. Esau was the firstborn, and he sold his firstborn birthright for a morsel of meat. And you know, the 144,000, they are the firstborn of God because they will be the one that will never see death and will be just translated. They are the firstborn. And now in these last days, no one should be a fornicator or a profane person who sells for a food his birthright, his to being a firstborn among the Christ who is the firstborn of the firstborns. So, this is our offer. We are called for this first birthright. And if we give it up, some people say, well, I cannot follow my study anymore. Well, you study further in heaven. Why be sad? Because you know Jesus is coming. 
oh, I cannot give up my work because I have such a good workplace and, and it has such a good income. And if I do that, and I just spoke recently with a um, friend of mine, a lady who said, I have such a good, uh, such a good, and I have such a good relationship with Jesus. And I just did it because I want to keep my working place. So you sell for food. You sell for a morsel of meat. Your birthright. Yes. And they will have the same experience as Esau. Because when grace will end and the seven plagues come, they will go to find the blessing. But they will have and will find nothing. And they will have find no place for repentance, though they will seek it carefully with tears. What a great and serious warning. Hebrews 12, 25 to 26, 28 and 29. See that he refused not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not whom refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So this is the choir that is repeating again and again. It's a great, great warning. Yes, the world will be shaken. And everything that can be moved will be moved. But we will have a kingdom that cannot be moved. We will stand firm in our God, looking forward to the victory. Now, what is the admonition or the warning? For what purpose? It is to not give away the word of God, spoken by angels, prophets, and his son, spoken to the whole world, giving them the promise, the rest, the great reward, giving them salvation. That is what he offers to all the world, to the humans of all this world. And the warning is, don't reject, don't neglect through unbelief this great, great offer. And that's a serious thing. And as we want to come to the conclusion to see Adam was created and was dependent on God until he separated from God, believing a lie, deceiving himself, he became dead. He was separated from God forever. And all his descendants now are born separated from God in a dark world under the control of Satan and humans. Jesus came, the Word made flesh. He was conceived by his Father and had his Father's nature by which he bound to God as Adam bound. And he also took the nature of Mary, the sinful nature in him, to destroy it in himself. The devil, the dragon, appears before he even is born to avoid his birth or when he is born to kill it. He does that through the beast, to one of the heads of the beast. Jesus must also encounter the false teachings of his time, the Pharisees and Sadducees and all those things he was confronted with. But he overcome them and destroyed in himself sin. And he destroyed sinful nature and rose up from the death as a second Adam, as a total new creature with a new identity, now being the son of God, the firstborn of God. This is the image of God. And he offers this life to all the captives of Satan down here. And everyone can enter just one way, by faith. And he enters by faith enters into the true worship, which means the Sabbath rests. Because here you have no rest. But as you enter into Christ, through Christ, you enter into the Sabbath rest. But this rest is a continual rest. The Sabbath day is just a sign of it when you have achieved it. So that comes at the end when everything is over and closed. Now, the devil, he's an imitator of that, what God does. So we know the beast, we know who it is, 
It's the eight, which is one of the seven heads, the fifth head, comes with a image of the beast in order to come to political power. It must have an image. It must have a God by which it brings all people to worship that God, to give them a mark, a new identity, exactly like God gives us here a new identity. He gives us his identity, which is not a name, but it's just a number of the name. So it's a number that is given us by the beast, and that is just a number. You are a slave. And this image of the beast is perfectly fitting to the, to the image of the devil, because the devil is a killer from the beginning. And now he presents to the world a killing agent that we must overcome by worshipping it, worshipping it in our bodies, putting in our bodies something that it might not kill us, that it might not destroy us. And everyone who worship it will get a new identity, he will be checked, he can go into the churches, he can go everywhere, because he's safe. What a contrast between what God offers and the devil offers. And even though it's such a contrast, like day and night, people are deceived and don't see it. And at the end, the Sunday, as a day, will just be that what confirms the worship of the devil. Now, whoever takes the mark, the Bible says, that is the point of no return. That's why the decision will be made by everyone. And everyone who has taken the mark of the beast is gone forever. He has sold his birthright. There is no way back. He might seek it with tears. It is not possible. That's why the, abomin the admonition, the warning of the book of Hebrews, that we should be very careful to not harden our heart, to be aware, aware what is God and what is not God, to not reject him who came in himself to destroy death and that what brings us to death and bring us alive so that we should not suffer death anymore especially we who are living these last days. So let us seriously pray that this study of the book of Hebrews will prepare us to prepare the way, to make us able to be the light of the world and in this year to finish the work. Amen.